So good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Kelly Nevins, and I'm the executive director of the Women's Fund of Rhode Island and one of the proud uh, conference workers, I guess if you could call me. Um, the Women's Fund of Rhode Island joins with women's commissions and other women's funds to make this, this conference possible, and we're really pleased to have you here. When we were talking, when we were planning the conference, and we were talking about doing a, a track on sexual harassment, there was a discussion about how, while many big businesses do trainings that uh, uh, help people to understand what sexual harassment is and how they might respond to it, um, we knew that a lot of the people coming to our conference maybe never benefited from that type of training. They may not have worked for a big organization that, that provided that kind of training. Um, and so we thought that it would be useful to do something like that for, for activists and for people who come from different nonprofits or even uh, educational institutions where this type of training just isn't common. I'm so pleased that my friend and local uh, Rhode Island trainer has come to speak with us this morning, or this afternoon. Uh, this is Dr. Judy Kay. She is a diversity- doctor. Okay. okay. <laughs> yeah, <I'm> just, <laughs> is a diversity <clears throat> practitioner with 25 years of experience in a wide range of industries, including business, healthcare, higher education, government, and the nonprofit sector. She's now going to be an internationally known trainer on this particular topic. Uh, she's going to Brussels in just a couple of weeks to, to share uh, similar information. Judy has designed and facilitated hundreds of workshops on diversity and inclusion, prevention of harassment and discrimination in the workplace and in the classroom, effective communication skills, and culturally competent patient care. She's also led strategic planning retreats and provides continuing education seminars on diversity for professionals in human resources, healthcare, and social work. Judy has served as the diversity uh, equal employment opportunity equal opportunity EEO. <laughs> EEO coordinator at Lifespan, uh, which is a major institution in Rhode Island, a healthcare institution, and she's conducted staff trainings oversaw affirmative action plans, promoted language access for limited English proficient patients, supervised employee resource groups, and produced a monthly diversity newsletter. She's a graduate of Brown University and Harvard Law School. She was an attorney for 10 years in legal services offices representing low-income clients in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. She speaks Spanish and has also conducted trainings in Spanish. So if you think this would be helpful to take Black back to your communities, <coughs> now you know all about her and what she what she has as a background. I'll Great. hand this over to Judy. Thanks so much. <laughs> so how many of you are uncomfortable when people like are reading about your credentials? <laughs> <laughs> Don't like it. But I keep telling myself it's probably partly gender driven. Yes. Right? Yes. You know, yes. and so I just I, I just own it. Own it, right, exactly. Uh, so let's test that uh, assumption or that, uh, that educated guess. How many of you have never had a formal workshop or course or seminar on sexual harassment? To find it? Great, great. And so those of you who have, I, I feel like it's always valuable to get a refresher and you know, maybe take it further and deeper. And I welcome your contributions if you have you've been exposed to the topic before and all, you know, had a question. And I, if you've never heard about it before, I welcome your questions. I don't think there's anything, uh, there's no question that's stupid in my mind, and there's no question that's politically incorrect for me. I think everything is an opportunity for, for learning and growing. And as you can see, my style is very informal. I'm not using PowerPoint. Are you happy with that? There's no PowerPoint slide. Um, and it will, I can guarantee you, it will be more, uh, it'll be even richer the extent to which you uh, participate. I can talk to you for an hour, 75 minutes straight. I have a lot of things to share. I'm passionate about the topic. And uh, I know just through experience that you will add so much and I will learn from you and you will learn from each other. So how many of you, and you can just do this by raising hand, how many of you, either you yourself or someone close to you has experienced possible sexual harassment in the workplace? Okay, so it's almost everybody. Uh, how many of you have been in a situation where possible sexual harassment was occurring and didn't do anything because you didn't know what to do or say? 
Um, how many of you, have you have been in a situation of possible, please come in and don't be shy about coming forward. We have seats, lots of seats up front. Uh, how many of you have been in a situation where possible sexual harassment might be occurring and somebody did step in and interrupt it? Great, great. So I like to, and I think this goes a, a lot uh, in the same vein that um, Tarana was talking about, that we don't want to just take a sort of disciplinary punitive approach. I mean, we need that, we need laws, we need protections, and we need to hold people accountable. But there's so much we can do that's proactive, that's constructive, that's positive, that's interrupting things when it's at a very low level of intensity, uh, so that we never have to really deal with full-blown sexual harassment, or at least we're able to more easily isolate the people in situations that are more extreme. Because also, as Tarana said, and isn't she awesome? She's so awesome. I got to hear her in Rhode Island a month or two ago, and it's like I, I could just go again and again and again. Um, as she also was saying at the end, we tend to uh, to make it into a binary, like like we do with a lot of other things, right? It's either sexual assault or it's not. There's good guys and bad guys, and in fact, most there is a lot of gray. And there is a lot, there is a continuum, there is a spectrum of behavior, and that's part of what makes this so challenging for people because they want a hard and fast rule. How do I know when? And I think we can liberate ourselves from anxiety about that because we have the capacity and the right and can develop the tools, as I said, to interrupt things at a much lower level of intensity so we never have to worry about it, hopefully, getting that extreme. Or we don't, we don't have to be the judge and jury to decide when something is sexual harassment. Like she said with that, uh, when they said take out the rape culture chapter and just call it something else, we can call it something else, you know? And when it's not full-blown sexual assault or when it's not, you know, sleep with me and you'll get the promotion, we can call it unprofessional, obnoxious, annoying, embarrassing, intrusive, right? Now think of all the things that you can do to describe what are more sort of garden variety or you know the, the lower levels of things that can develop sexual harassment. Um, so how many of you have uh, spoken up yourself and the person who was engaging in whatever offensive or unacceptable conduct towards you, that person actually stopped and said, I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, that happened. And so again, my hope is that we can strengthen our own confidence and, and competence to be able to do that when it's appropriate. You know, there, it, that isn't the best response in some situations. Um, how many of you know that all the legal principles that apply to sexual harassment prevention also apply to harassment based on other protected identities like race and religion and disability and gender identity. So if you didn't know that, now you do, <laughs> right? So we're gonna be focusing on sexual harassment, but keep in mind throughout this that harassment is a form of illegal discrimination. And as such, it violates state and federal anti-discrimination laws and many company policies, many organizational policies. Uh, and uh, is anybody here from New York? New York, I think, has just, hello, New York. New York has just become the first state to mandate sexual harassment prevention training for all employers, regardless of size. A lot of states have a threshold of, you know, 25 or 50 or, or something like that. But in New York, it's, it's mandatory for all employers. So um, let's start with just, and I, I like, like I said, I like it to be interactive. I want to write on the board. I'm going to have to keep walking around the table, so please be indulgent with me. If we moved it, we were going to have to move everything back, so we decided not to do that. So um, if I come in and I say, um, hey, it's really great to see you. You've been on vacation, right? It's great to see you, just like that. How many of you would not feel sexually harassed? Yeah, I hope not. OK. And, um, and if I said, hey, um, you know, uh, you look great today, how many of you would not feel sexually harassed? Okay, what would you call that kind of a comment? A compliment, friendly, a compliment, okay? And uh, I can tell from your response that uh, it's good, right? That, you know, you felt good about it and I felt good about saying it, right? 
Now, if I corner somebody in the supply closet <laughs> late at night and I get very close to them and then I'm ogling their body and I say, you look really nice today, how many of you feel like that might be sexual harassment. <laughs> okay? So this is why I say it's not about political correctness, because people say, oh, you can't compliment anybody anymore. Bull. Right. Right? It's, you know, you look really nice today. There's nothing wrong with those five words. It all depends on context. 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 Another C word. Circumstances. Right? So uh, context, circumstances. Exactly. You have to look at all the factors, and we want it to be simple, and people often were mentally lazy. You know, we just want to know right away. But unfortunately, that tendency we have to want to make a really quick judgment is a lot of the, I think, a lot of the problems that we're getting into today, because we do make quick judgments about a lot of different groups and situations. Um, and it's understandable because, you know, there are a lot of bad things happening right now, and a lot of groups are being um, targeted. At the same time, we can do ourselves a disservice by, I think, um, uh, oversimplifying situations and looking too soon to be able to characterize them as one thing or another, when very often it, it does depend on the circumstances. So let's take that situation that I gave you of, you look really nice today. What was the difference between the two ways that I said it? Hi, you look really nice today, and cornering you in the supply closet, and looking you up and down, and saying, you look really nice today. <laughs> what's the difference? You said the context was different, but what specifically was different? Tone. What about the tone was different? Salacious. I like that word. Uh, salacious. Anybody? Can you say what salacious means? I was waiting for that word sex. Salacious. Salacious is a great embellishment of the word sex. So it's sexual in, in, it was more sexual in nature, right? And it wasn't too hard to discern that there was some sexual something in there. Now, just to stretch your imagination even further, imagine a situation where that might be okay. I corner you in the supply closet, I look you up and down and say, you look really good today. You're married, or it's your partner, your significant other, right? I do a lot of work in hospital systems, and people are sometimes working at opposite shifts and they never see each other. So it's like, I'll meet you in the supply closet, you know? Or the <laughs> shift, right? So it's a serious topic, but we can enjoy learning about it. We can have fun learning about it. So what's the main difference in that situation? What's going on that wasn't going on in the previous it was, one? It was wanted. It was wanted, yeah. yeah. Yes, your hand right here in front. Um, what's the intent? So like, one, the intention is maybe whereas the other, it's like, you just wanted to compliment me to feel better. Okay, great. Hold on to that, because I'm going to come back to the question of intent. But the first thing I'm going to say is, or write down, is if you remember nothing else from today, remember what makes harassment harassment is that it's unwelcome and it's unwanted. That's the first threshold issue. Now, does that have anything to do with the other person's intent who said it? No. Hold, on, hold your question for one second. So if I'm cornering you, in the, if I'm not, in, the, I'm not in, your, in an intimate relationship with you, right, where it was welcome, in that second scenario where I'm, you're, it's not welcome and I'm cornering you in the supply closet and saying, you look really nice today, does it matter if I say, my intention is to be really friendly? No. No, right? So actually, intent is not relevant to whether or not something is harassment. Mm -hmm. Now, it might be relevant in some other way, shape, and form. I mean, certainly, if we do something inadvertent, you know, if I, and actually this happened to me once, where I was doing a team building activity with a group and we were all fully clothed and you had to climb up a rope and swing and we had a whole team of people in you know, blue jeans, and one of the women was having trouble going up the rope. She wasn't very athletic, and we were pushing her up, and when the uh, exercise was over, she said, I touched her crotch, and I had sexually violated her. So I can empathize with people, who, you know, and with men in particular who say, well, you know, somebody might accuse me of it. Yeah, they might, but I, you know, I knew I hadn't done anything, right? Everybody around me knew I hadn't done anything. So what happens if, you know, you step on somebody's toe really hard without meaning to, what do you do? 
Sorry. I'm sorry. And what else do you do? Make sure they're okay. Make sure they're okay. What else? Remember, I'm still on your toe. Move. Yeah, get off your, stop doing it. Right, and that's really, that's the main thing that we want initially, and, and most of the time, is we want the behavior to stop. It's not like how many of us wake up in the morning and say, boy, I can't wait to complain about a coworker so they lose their job. You know, I can't wait to ruin somebody's life today. No, what we just want to do, we want to be treated with respect and dignity, and if we're not, we want, it, we want the bad behavior to stop. We want to be able to put our energy into our work or our passion or you know, our family, whatever it is, our community. Um, so the intent might matter if, you know, if I step on your toe inadvertently or when I, when I touch that person inadvertently, I felt horrible. And that's the other thing. Most of the time, even the person that does it, and how many of you have had this experience where you have called somebody out on something? It might have been a racial joke. It might have been a touching a sexual comment that was inappropriate. And you called them out on it in a hopefully kind, respectful way. And they were like really embarrassed or really you know, uh, recanted it right away. That happens too. And that's why I think, again, it's in our interest to develop the skill set to be able to do that in situations where it's appropriate. Um, because it, it strengthens our own uh, competency, empowers us. It's also very effective. It's more effective at actually getting the behavior to end. It's effective often at actually strengthening a working relationship with somebody. Um, when you have that kind of good communication and you're not walking on eggshells and uh, you know, dancing around things. Um, and, and most of the time, people are gonna do the right thing. It's like stepping, you know, they don't mean to step on your toe. You know, wouldn't, if I um, am still on your toe with a heavy book, a heavy boot, uh, and I said, oh, you must have a very sensitive toe. I'm, I'm not standing on you very hard. You know, what's your problem, right? That wouldn't be appropriate. But somehow in this arena, we often get that response, right? Well, I didn't intend it, therefore, you're being oversensitive, right? And so somehow, you know, we, we need to be able to get over that uh, barrier and be and sometimes to be able to say to somebody you know I know you probably didn't mean to offend me or to embarrass me and that comment or that behavior is actually unwelcome to me and I'd like it to stop most of the time I'm going to propose most of the time that's actually going to be very effective and when it's not it helps us isolate the people who are really the problem who are fewer and further between but somebody who is a real harasser tends to do it again and again and again. And will do it even though you said it's unwanted. And if they can't do it to you anymore, they'll go do it to somebody else. Because it's really about what and not about sex? Power. It's really about power. Yes? Can I, I just want to add something that Please. Um, I think in times, especially when I was younger and I was, had more fear than I do now, um, that I might have said something like, oh, I'm not interested. Mm -hmm. I don't have to explain why I'm not. That's right. It's right. unwanted. Right. You know? Again, you don't have to explain it. Right. And at the same time, let's also feel like we can be authentic. You know, sometimes somebody may actually be interested in you. Right? It may start out as attraction, and it may be totally relevant to be able to say, I'm actually involved with somebody. Yes, I saw a hand back there. Yes. We are using a lot of work, uh, but we are calling out behavior that is, uh, you know, for whatever reason, inappropriate because, as we said, sexual harassment is a continuum and there is so much going on and can be sexual, but there is all sorts of other things. And sometimes it's just sexism when we are within the gender issue. Right. But sexism, you know, exactly. So we are using this distinction as a way to learn to voice exactly. and understand that, yeah, we might not have. But the impact that thing had on me exactly. meant something so eerie. To, you know, exactly. and, that, and that's it's tough, but yeah. we, are, we are using that as a little. I think people are starting to catch on. on yeah, that. people it's are tough. doing that more. And I think one of the reasons it's so effective is that it doesn't accuse the other person yeah. of being a bad person, right? It's describing the impact, which is different than saying you're being a sexist pig. Right, so when I was practicing law when I was much younger and there were many fewer women in the courtroom and almost no women on the bench, 
and occasionally I'd be, you know, arguing a case, and the judge would say, "Sit down, sweetheart. Your turn, counselor." You know, right now, again, not sexual, but sexist, right? Which also is uh, included in this. Um, was that by itself harassment? Do you think, or was it? you know, unprofessional, sexist, but not quite yet harassment. We'll go there next. Um, so when he said things like that, you know, the impact on me, I was very tempted to, you know, file a complaint with the Judicial Ethics Commission. And, but, you know, I didn't think they were necessarily going to be too uh, receptive either. Plus, I needed to go in front of this judge again, right? So I needed, I wanted to have a working relationship with this person. And I got up the courage to go to his chambers and say, when you called me sweetheart in front of my client, I was really concerned that my client might not have total confidence in me. You know, it felt, it felt it, it demeaning, diminishing of me. And what do you think the judge said when I put it that way? He apologized. He was probably old enough to be my father. He did. And you know, sometimes things come out of people's mouths. We're conditioned. You know, my five-year-old son, when he was five, asked for one of those big toy kitchens. And the grandparent immediately said, oh, that's for girls. Oh, I can't believe I said that. Right. You know, it's like I intellectually I know that's not true, but you know that's right. And then the grandparent still wouldn't get in the kitchen. I've got one of those little lockers with a punching bag thing which he like never used. And then when his twin sisters got the kitchen, when they were two, he would he would you know he was so excited he set it up he was playing with it. Yeah, what was your uh, what was your question? I was just exploring the statements unwelcome and unwanted, that oftentimes, whether it's sexual assault, violence, or harassment, we see it as a one-time incident, right. and that something may have been wanted for a period of time, right. and then at some point in that relationship, it was no longer wanted, and you continue. Great. And at that point, it could be harassment right. once right. it's unwelcome. So this is why I love the participation, because here now, I can like check off all these things on my, on my list. Go ahead. And also, when I was bringing up intent before, someone can say that, oh, I'm just being friendly, but there's also, you have to note that they could just be saying that. Right, could be a pretext. To excuse the, the right. behavior, but it's also important to understand what are the true intentions, yes. and, and those, those should also be relevant. Right, and what is the intention most relevant for, right? It's not gonna change what the impact is, but what might it influence? If I know, like, when I inadvertently touch that woman's crotch, or if I, you know, do this and accidentally, you know, brush somebody's breast, or something at work, and oh, I'm so sorry. What, and then that person files a complaint against me anyway, and says that I sexually harassed them. At that point, might intent be relevant? I think so, yeah, as to what the response should be, because what the legal standard is, an employer can't necessarily, where did I put the things, can't necessarily prevent every single person in a company from doing anything that might remotely potentially be sexual harassment, right? They can when it involves supervisors. Supervisors are held to a higher standard. But when it's between equals or coworkers, what the employer's responsibility is that once they know or should know, and we can talk about what that means, that there's conduct that might be sexual harassment, they have an uh, obligation to take immediate and appropriate corrective action. So that's where I think, you know, intent has, would be very relevant there as to what would be appropriate. Is what's appropriate an apology and maybe rearranging the furniture so people aren't always bumping into each other, like in a restaurant where sexual harassment is endemic in very close quarters? Or is it somebody who said they were, it was an accident, but the, all the evidence was, and from 10 other people, that this person just happens to always accidentally brush up against women's breasts, and so people know that it's a pretext, and in that situation, the appropriate corrective action might be something much stronger, right? Corrective action. Okay, did I miss hands that were up already where somebody had a question or comment they wanted to say yet? Yeah. Wondering just if whether there was some sort of technical difference between like welcome and unwanted, or are they synonyms? Synonyms, synonyms, yep. I hope you come back. Okay, so let's, and we're gonna just jump around all over the place and then I'll have my checklist and I'll come back to it and make sure I covered everything. So I'm, if I'm hearing your question, is there anybody who didn't hear what was asked? 
So I think of that as what's my recourse? And, and what are all my avenues of recourse? Because I think the other thing we want to keep in mind is there's usually more things we can do and more actions we can take than we may initially recognize or think possible. Again, I think it's a way that we, in our, you know, we're, 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 we have this reptile part of us. You know, when we feel threatened, we go into fight or flight mode, right? You know about that. And it, the blood rushes to your extremities so you can defend yourself or so you can run away. And the third thing is sometimes often we just freeze, right? And you don't know what to say. Um, so that's, that's part of our human wiring. We shouldn't be ashamed of that when that happens. The good news is, is that we have ways of bypassing or at least or overriding or rising above that reptile reaction and triggering, you know, bringing into consideration our higher thinking, our frontal cortex, frontal neocortex, people who know neuroscience would know that better than I do. So how do you do that? How do you go from that state, that stress reaction to being able to think more clearly and calmly. How do, what ways do people do that? Practice. Practice, and how do you practice? What do you do? In it, in it, when you're alone, you practice saying no, or I'm not interested, or um, I can't get voice. I can't get to that yet, because okay. I'm in such a state of arousal, I'm all stressed out. Take how do I? Take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. Um, right, first I need a physiologically, it becomes a physiological response, right? So I need a physiologically, calm my neurological system so that I can think through, I'm gonna say no, right? And I'm, and I'm, or I'm not gonna say no, it's not safe to say no, I'm, I'm, I am going to run away, right? But we don't think clearly when we're triggered, and that's true if we hear a racist comment, that's true if we hear an anti-Semitic comment, I mean, that's why I say all these things are, are interconnected. And it's okay if in the moment we don't know what to do or say because we're human. And many times we can go back afterward and still say something, especially when it's somebody we have a relationship with. Like I don't remember if I did it that exact day. I might have gone and talked to the judge another day when I was feeling more in control of myself, right? So the first thing is always to you know, take care of yourself. Don't blame yourself, right? Be kind to yourself. Calm yourself, and sometimes that means you know crying or screaming to somebody else, or getting angry, or writing, or you know venting, um, and then you can start thinking through. Okay, do I want to respond to this? How do I want to respond to this? What would be most effective? And what are my goals? Well, I think we sometimes forget the what do I want to have happen down the road, not just in this situation, but is this somebody I want to preserve a relationship with? Because my response might well be different if this is somebody that I have to present a case in front of tomorrow than a stranger who did something in a store, right, where I can go talk to the manager and the manager might bar that person from coming into the store, right? That's a very different action and a very different situation. And I think often we collapse them all, like there's one response and we have to have the clever comeback or we have to go to the right person and it might not work the first time, but if we think it through, there are often other remedies. Yeah, you have a hand up. I wonder how you balance that. Say when you went to the judge and explained how that made you feel. How do you balance that with the worry of what if he didn't care? What if he blew you off? And now what if he views you in a different light? Yeah. And you have another case in the future. How's that going to impact your career? Yeah. So that's part of the calm thinking, right? I can't do that in the moment when I'm insulted or embarrassed or angry at him when that happened, right? And I don't remember exactly how I thought it through, but I remember I did go back and talk to people about it and thought it through and, and got input from other people. And we said, you know, should I file the complaint? Well, if I don't file the complaint and I say nothing, I'm still gonna be worried every time I go in the courtroom, right? So if I t talk to him, is it really gonna be any different? It's just a different kind of risk I'm taking, right? Because if I say nothing, I've got the burden of going in front of a judge who I now know to be sexist. If I don't, if I say something, I now have a little bit of risk that he might be angry at me. But then people said to me, well then there is something else you can do. There's a chief judge, or there is this ethics board, or there is this judge who's on our board. I, I worked for a legal a federally funded legal services office, right? They said if the judge isn't receptive, we'll have so-and-so who's the head of our board go talk to him to say that we will not countenance people not being treating our lawyers professionally. See what I'm saying? You can get more creative. And you can start thinking of lots of things that you can do. Yeah. Um, in, this comes from thinking about working as a 
drivers. It sounds an awful lot like you're talking about safety planning, um, and that that is part of the process of preparing for that figuring out how you're going to react to it. And safety planning would involve everything that you did, but then also thinking about what would be the emotional yep. like care you might precisely. And I love that. I've never heard it put that way. And I would say it's safety planning and success planning. Right, because it's not just that you want this bad situation to end, it's that you want to end up in a better and higher place. You want to hopefully have sh shaped or influenced somebody else's, perhaps sexist perception, or reined in power that they didn't realize they were abusing. You'll be successful that way. You're being successful for yourself because you're handling an obstacle, right, or a challenge, which is gonna be very empowering and give you skills for other situations. And then, obviously, at the same time, you always have to be thinking about safety. Yes? So these conversations um, are always just a little bit frustrating for me because I feel like we recognize that something has gone wrong in this interaction with another human being. Um, but we immediately think of the other person's feelings and the other person's reactions. Instead of as if that person stepped on our toe, we would say, dude, you're on my toe. And so it's frustrating that that you know that we spend a lot of time worrying about the other person's reaction, and and I feel like we all need to do a better job of supporting each other and conditioning ourselves in reacting to situations like that as dispassionately and as quickly as you would if someone. You know, right. Well on said. Yourself. Well said. And sometimes the direction, sometimes we veer into those waters in a session like this quickly because that is where people think, you know, those are the questions that people raise, right? Those were where a lot of the anxieties are. So you're right, we can also strengthen our own perception of, I come first. Right? I don't feel like we've developed the language yes. yet to allow ourselves That's to, right. in a dispassionate way, exactly. say, well, that, you know, you crossed the line. You may not realize it, but you just stepped on my toe really hard, right? right? In a way that you may not recognize. Let's come up with some more phrases, yes? I think in my own experience too, like going off of that, this, again, might just be a personal experience, but I've noticed that a lot of the women in my life tend to blame themselves when something yep. goes wrong. Mm -hmm. And so you're like, oh, what? well, maybe I'm, my shirt was too low cut, or oh, maybe like I have breasts, so now right. it's my fault. <laughs> 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 some um, corporate, uh, there was an article that came out in the Harvard Business Review very recently since the whole Kavanaugh thing um, called, It's Not Always Clear What Constitutes Sexual Harassment. And this particular professor, Kathleen Reardon, came up with a, a spectrum from like generally not offensive common things like complimenting somebody on their hairstyle to awkwardly, mildly offensive, right? Again, that, that, that spectrum, that continuum. So comments implying maybe a gender distinction that's unfavorable, but you know, not, not egregious, to something that is, that is clearly offensive, to something that's highly offensive, to something that actually now has maybe some sexual misconduct in it, to something that is egregious sexual conduct that might be a sexual assault or you know, something like that. And you could even go further, right? Then you get to genocide and, and other things. Because some of you may have seen there's a, there's a pyramid of hate that the um, ADL, the Anti-Defamation League, has created that says that you know, genocide doesn't come out of the blue, that it's built on biased attitudes here, and then biased actions, and then, let's see, I have it right here on my, uh, on my phone, and then 
uh, stronger actions, which are discrimination, excluding people, right, taking away people's rights, and then higher up you might get to some kind of uh, bias-based violence, which we're seeing, right, and then that taken to an nth degree would be, uh, you know, would be the absolute worst. And so, you know, a lot of the situations that we're going to be dealing with are going to be at the lower levels of the pyramid. Yeah. What was that first? That first tier bias? What? Bias attitudes. Thank you. So this is where you know stereotypes and jokes, um, and you know comments and and things that people often think they're being funny, right? And again, you know, can we develop the ability to say, you know, people used to think that was funny, but it's actually not funny anymore, right? Why did you say that? You know, let's talk about that. Now, like we did when people were using the word gay as an you know, I hear that much less now than I used to. People find, you know, it was like critical mass where people got at some point that even though they didn't mean anything by it, they could know, they did know that they were trying to say something negative using a word that was then oppressive to gay people. And so they finally said, okay, even though I'm not a bad person, I get now that I can't use it, you know, that I don't have to use this word anymore. Right, so absolutely we should be doing that. Let's go back to the example of a joke. So let's say somebody um, makes a sexist joke. They tell a blonde joke in the workplace, okay? How many of you would probably think you might be offended by that? Okay, how many of you would call that definitely gender-based harassment? One joke, the first joke. Okay, a few hands went up, but not a lot. Okay, so some people would feel strongly enough about it that they would call that harassment. At least right now, it might be hard to get a judge to agree with you. Because according to sort of the courts, and you know, it's, you know, keep in mind, who ultimately decides whether something's harassment? A judge, right? We don't want to go there because we don't know who the judge is going to be or the jury, and it might not be somebody who's going to take our needs seriously. So again, that's why I'm all about the prevention at the lower levels, because even if I, you know, we have 50 expert witnesses say that that's harassment, that, that's what happened with the Kavanaugh hearing, right? It's, you know, it didn't get the right result. So that's why the more we can accomplish, you know, that's within our sphere of influence instead of relying on other people to protect us and to explain it. Um, but anyway, now I lost my train of thought. What was I just blonde talking about? Blonde jokes. Blonde jokes, thank you. So someone tells a blonde joke. It looked like the majority opinion was it was not yet sexual harassment. So the person, so we speak up and we say, actually, you know, I don't appreciate blonde jokes. They used to be thought to be funny. They're not funny anymore. And the person says, okay, uh, I'm, I'm sorry. You're probably right. I was you know, not thinking. I won't use blonde jokes again. How many of you would think at that point that there still is gender-based harassment happening? Much, much less so. We've got one or two hands still going up. Um, but mostly people are feeling like, no, at that point it was resolved. It was a step on the toe. The person said, ouch. The person apologized. The person stopped doing it. It has been diffused. It has been dispelled. There's no uh, misconduct going on anymore. Now, if the person responds and says, well, I think that's ridiculous. I think blonde jokes are really funny. And so now I'm going to tell you another one. <laughs> Could that be getting closer to being gender-based harassment? Yes. Now everybody's saying yes. <laughs> so we have, and it doesn't mean you, we were, anybody was wrong who thought the first one was, because there could be a set of circumstances where that single joke, if it's told by a boss, if it's told in a certain context, might have the impact that's enough to actually be gender-based harassment. Uh, you know, that's possible. But in, you know, in a sort of garden variety situation in a staff meeting or you know, in some less um, a high profile situation, it's just a bad joke. If it's not, if it gets repeated, we have some common sense notion that that is relevant. So something may, may be offensive, it might be sexist, it might be inappropriate, it might be stereotypical, it might be biased, but for it to actually be illegal harassment, it either has to be sufficiently frequent or, in the alternative, it could be an isolated incident, but what would you imagine would have to be true about that isolated incident? It's really egregious. Really egregious, right? It would have to be uh, 
either by frequency or severity. Right? So, yes? I think we should consider the uh, environment. The, to me, that's very indicative because if you did it in the supply room, your mind is somewhere else. Yes. So, circumstances, yeah. right? So, there could be a circumstance where what in another context might be annoying could mm -hmm. actually be threatening, right? right? Absolutely. Yep. I, I would uh, embellish on that to say that if it's coworker to coworker and doesn't involve somebody in a power position, if it's coworker to coworker, and when it happened, the employer at that point knew or should know and took immediate and took immediate and appropriate corrective action, that they would have a defense to sexual harassment. In other words, in a situation. In most situations that don't involve a supervisor, if it is sort of run of the mill, low level, you know, bottom of the pyramid kind of sexual harassment, bottom of the, you know, lower intensity sexual harassment, legally, the employer is not liable if, as soon as they knew or should have known, they took immediate and appropriate corrective action. And what often happens in these cases is that they don't do that, right? The manager is dismissive. Oh, don't pay attention to that person. They're just a jerk, right? Or, you know, ignore it and it'll go away. That's not taking immediate and appropriate corrective action. Yeah. Yeah, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm looking at the language that um, I think it all says there has to be a pattern. Um, it has to be repeated. Right. That's the frequency. Yeah. Right, thank you. So that the pattern is the frequency, but remember, it doesn't have to be a pattern if it's egregious enough. Yeah. Yeah. So a firefighter, I did some more uh, sexual harassment prevention for a firehouse, and they reported in the past that when the first female firefighter came on board, most of the men adapted to it. Some of them grumbled because they had to take down the girly calendars. They had to change the culture. Most of them did the right thing and adapted. One or two people, one or two men were genuinely bigoted or hostile to having a woman colleague and urinated around her bed. You know, women have to sleep, you sleep overnight in a firehouse, right? That was found to be gender-based harassment, right? That was expressing enough hostility and threat, and so, and the employer could say, well, it only happened once, now we're gonna correct it. Well, so sorry, you know, you should have done more to prevent that, right? Because especially in, an, does, it, does anybody work in an industry where it is skewed, it is mostly male environment? What kind of environments are you in? What kind of organization? Politics, Politics yeah. State house. State house. State house. Yeah, uh, like government, yeah, key example. So, but, you know, this reaction now, like you're doing all the sexual harassment training, it's important and there is so much that can be done proactively to prevent this stuff from happening, right? So these kinds of conversations about how can legislators or staffers talk to each other or signal when things are crossing the line at lower levels so it doesn't get to that point, yeah? So I think one of the big things I took out of it too is that I dealt with a situation with sexual harassment with my supervisor with a coworker of mine I remember like I didn't really realize it was happening while it was happening because I kept being like, oh, it's not that big of a deal right. kind of thing. And I think she as well was like, yeah. we were talking about it. Didn't have a huge negative right. impact. Yeah. But I think what happened is since we didn't have any training or anything like that, we didn't I always say like the metaphor is like the goal line was moved. So I would keep moving it little by little and be like, oh well that wasn't that bad. That was not a big of a deal. And then at some point it was over here and I was like, oh, how did I get how here? How did you get there? So right. like if someone says something inappropriate and I don't make a thing about it, then they're like, oh, it's okay to say those things all the time. Right. And then if I'm not okay with it, it's like, well, you should have said, no, right. it's like right. one of those things where you need to have a line at first. Right. And I was just too young and naive to really realize that I needed that, like, because it was a supervisor, so it couldn't be the same relationship as a coworker. And there were lines that Sure, I well, the reality about. is, we don't always know in advance where that line is. Right, because yeah. it depends on the circumstances. Yeah. And so what we just need to remember and empower, empower ourselves around is, at the point at which is it, it is unwelcome mm -hmm. and having a negative impact, that is the legitimate moment to say, this is unacceptable to me. And it doesn't, you know, and when people say, well, you didn't mind it before, you might say, yeah, I didn't. And I do now, <laughs> yeah. right? And you have an obligation to stop it. Yeah. 
actually just want your views on that. I think uh, one of the things that we can all do is to, on one hand, depending on the position we are, we are at, as managers, it's always important to remind our, um, the people we work with to reach us. Exactly. So to me, because we don't know, because it's right. moving yeah. constantly, right. and this is another job mm -hmm. right. in many ways. Yeah. As, as, uh, as our trainer said, we're not the judges of okay. Right. Encourage, people, encourage people to come forward. Exactly. Report it. There are so many ways. Find out the That's right. And office. enlightened employers will have multiple yeah. venues. You know, you can go to your own manager, unless it's the manager who's bothering you, right? You can go to any manager, because sometimes people have a relationship with somebody in another department who they worked for or who they know personally. There's, you know, you can go to a human resources person. Some big companies sometimes specifically have a liaison around this. Um, so, and, and again, you know, you could go tell a friend, and this is where we all come in as upstanders or bystanders, right? Our role may primarily be to encourage a coworker to come forward and to stand with them when they do that, right? And at that point, I just want to mention, um, a lot of times people don't come forward because they're afraid of retaliation, losing their job, having their work sabotaged, which of course is a real risk, bad things happen. and. It can be empowering to know that retaliation is itself illegal. Even if the harassment ends up being mistaken and actually didn't happen, you misheard somebody or it was an inadvertent touching and there's an investigation and it's found that there was no harassment, you are still protected as the person who complained, as a witness who gave information because you observed it, or as just somebody who went to support a coworker to report it. The accused, if it was like me, uh, and the team building activity where I didn't do anything wrong, but now I had kind of the stigma of having been accused of something, which was very mortifying. All of us are protected theoretically. I know it doesn't always work this way in the real world, but theoretically we are protected from retaliation. And, and again, by stepping forward, in a lot of ways we're actually in a stronger position because then it's made explicit that we've now complained. So we are protected against retaliation. If we don't complain, and, and then the boss you know, gives us a bad performance review, how are we going to prove that was retaliation? Yes? Okay, so one of the studies I've been working on is the constraints to reporting. Constraints to reporting during a report, um, particularly around women of color. And so one of the things that came up in terms of our study was that people didn't know, it was also we thought about fear, but also people didn't know where and how to report. Yes. And so that puts you in a situation where you want to do something, but you don't know how to do that. Yeah. You're already scared anyway. Right. So the question is, what are the, I'm assuming that employers must be able to let people know, they should be letting people know where and how to do that. Yes. Now if that's not happening, um, what is the legal redress around that? Anybody ever thought about that? So who's in an organization and you know you have a sexual harassment policy, prevention policy, and you've read it? Okay, how many of you are in an organization and you don't know if there's a sexual harassment prevention policy? How many of you are in an organization and you know that there is not a sexual harassment prevention policy? Okay, so the organizations that don't have one should probably have one. Um, the Mass Commission Against Discrimination is a possible place to start. Again, depending on who you are, you might know a board member you can talk about it to. Like the, one of the companies I'm working with is a startup company and they're just they're just coming up with their HR policies as they're growing. You know, when it was five people in a garage, they didn't know they needed one, right? So uh, I want to be sure I finish answering your question. The policy should say, this is who you go to in this organization. The policy should also make clear that people, while we encourage people to resolve it internally, you can go to external enforcement agencies right away if you want. That will make it more adversarial. That will make it more like a a court case, but you can go to the Mass Commission Against Discrimination, which is the Human Rights Commission in Connecticut, all of, pretty much all states have them. There's also a Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, has a main office in Boston and in other regions, and you can file a complaint there, and they have to look into it, and they have some enforcement power. They can restore you to a job, they can, afford, uh, they can order back wages, but it might take several years, right? And it will be very emotionally stressful. So that's why I usually encourage people if possible, take advantage of whatever internal mechanism there is, even if it's informal. You, know, you might not want to go right to HR. You first might want to talk to a friendly manager and have them you know, talk to somebody. You might want to get together with some people who've had the same experience and write a letter 
you know, whatever. I, I do the hand here and then I'll come back so over here. The, the follow up question on that is at what point, like, let's say you talk about that start, how much time do they have to do that? I mean, I assume they should be doing the media. And my yes. concern really has to do with the fact that you might have big organizations that have all these policies, yes. but they're not really making sure that the, the, employer, the employees know that. And to me, that that is a problem. And I'm asking the question is there some kind of legal redress for the fact that? You know, yes, we have the policy, so the employees can show it, but they're not really, really, not really sure the employers it. know about these policies. Maybe you could do a survey and you find out. Right. So that, is there some legal? legal yeah, policy? many of them are not adequately yeah. I implemented or, or promoted. This new New York law that makes it mandatory for training for every employer, they have a deadline as to when you have to train your whole workforce and when you have to have a policy in place. And the also nice thing is New York and Massachusetts and Connecticut, they've got the model policy right online. You don't even have to write it. You just have to download it and fill in the name of your organization and you're all set, right? So no reason your company shouldn't do that. As to what kind of enforcement power you have to you know, make them do that, in New York you've got it now. But I think a lot of it, this is where, you know, um, it, this is where our empowerment comes in, you know, pushing for it. But I'm, I'm just, but I'm really talking about is the employer making sure the employees know about No, the they're often not making sure yeah, the employees that's, know that's, that's that. No, you're right. Yeah, yeah, no, you're right. Because if you don't know where you want to go, that's right. then you might not do it to the employees. That's right. So it's a huge It is. It is. You know, you're absolutely right. And so, and the focus of this workshop is what can we do? So if you're in one of those organizations, are you in a position to do something about that? You might be. Are you in a position to influence somebody to get your organization to be more proactive, to tell employees about it, to insist that it be posted, right? To have it discussed at staff meetings. And if you don't have that kind of influence, then you've got to go through a different planning process about how can I make that happen, right? Where, where are the pressure points going to be? Yeah. So New York now doesn't have that exemption for smaller employers. Right. What is what's the situation here? Where's the threshold? Oh, it might be like 15. Oh, I should have re looked it up. I'm not sure. Does anybody know in Massachusetts? For training or for uh, for um, being subject to Title VII, to the civil rights law, to the state equal employment opportunity law. In Massachusetts, it's fairly low. It might be like four or five. I think it's six. Six, and then at the federal level, it's going to jump to 15 or right. So I don't know all the numbers in all the states. Um, Rhode Island, it's four. So if you're a mom and pop or a mom and mom store, uh, you may technically uh, be exempt. So that's sometimes where the pressure comes up, right? With where you organize, you know, you let the other patrons know and say, let's boycott the store because of how they're treating people, right? You have other things. There's always other things we can do. So we should never give up here and then here and then here. Great. Um, so I raise my hand to being one of the people who works for an organization where we don't have a policy around sexual harassment. I work with three other people who, you know, we built the company together and the company culture. However, I'm a consultant and I'm out in the field a lot. Uh -huh. So we do have a policy though around the things that could happen to you when you're out in the field and especially because you know, we're in client services, and our office is in Boston, and everybody, like 90% of our business is return clients right. or referrals. Mm -hmm. So that word gets out as well. So even while, you know, we don't have a policy internally, we do have a policy around a client did this thing, or I witnessed right. this thing out in the field, and how we go about documenting that. Right. And that was really front of mind for me when I was Great. working in rural Kentucky in early 2017 with a bunch of county judges and just like, well, what happens right. when this thing happens? So we document all of that. So yep. just another That's lens on And that. in most sexual harassment policies, it will explicitly say this policy applies to interns, volunteers, consultants, vendors, mm -hmm. customers. So again, don't feel that you can't do anything because it wasn't an employee. Yeah, my question was regarding our elected officials. Is yeah. there a requirement for them to undergo any sexual harassment training on a local, yeah. state, or federal state level? State by state. We have it in Rhode Island now. You can hear from Teresa Tan. Uh, what about federally? Uh, <laughs> 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 no, not that I know of. There might be more than Congress now, but I don't think a blanket rule. So now that we have a different Congress, you know, that could change, right? All these things could be strengthened. Yeah, did you have a comment or question? I'm a state legislator in Rhode Island, and um, I'm responsible for us having the training in oh, Rhode Island. Oh, you're true! Yes. 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 I know, I'm here, but I've never met you. You're the Speaker of the House, right? Well, well the, I, um, I, I spoke out. Yeah. <laughs>
only one right. who experienced it, but I was the only one who publicly shared my story. And um, the response was, well, what happens in the building is the only purview that we have to deal with. Another story came out and the, um, uh, another legislator was being harassed. Um, her story was much more pervasive and severe, uh, but the details are not out there. But it was alleged that it happened out, we go to fundraisers every night. We don't have access to our leadership. We want to go past, we need to have a relationship with our chairman, um, uh, or women, because there are a few of them, um, as well as leadership. Right? Right. We have to have that access to them. And the only way we get that access is by going out after work. We go to fundraisers, we go to yeah. mini dinners, we go, everything is really, all the work of getting your bill passed is done outside of the building. And now the speaker is sitting here being barraged, saying it didn't happen in the workplace. It doesn't matter. But how do we, for the public, to have that understanding? Because he really is like, it didn't happen at 82 Smith Street. Well, maybe you and I can work on an article for the Providence Journal, or a TV thing, or some radio spots, because the policy followed anything that is work-related you, will be, you should be protected by the policy and the law. If you're doing it because it comes within your job description, so to speak, yeah. the policy goes with you. It goes outside the four walls. It goes outside regular work hours. Now, the more tangential the situation becomes to the workplace, the less control. Remember, because the standard is that the employer, once they know or should know, have to take immediate and appropriate corrective action, as well as prevent. There are some things they're going to have less influence over preventing and correcting, right? Well, it's, there are some situations that are going to get remote enough, but any, you know, any conference, any meeting, any, you know, required interactions that you're supposed to have with consultants or customers or members of the public, you don't have to put up with harassment in any of those situations, and we need to do a better job of getting the word out about that and publicizing them and holding people accountable. So this is the handout, and. The great thing about your participation is the liveliness and the, and the um, you know, the, the immediacy of the questions you're asking. Um, I want to be sure that I cover everything on this sheet, okay? So we're going to take a break from questions for a minute and um, just go through it. So who doesn't have one yet? Does everybody have one? Okay. So the first page, uh, so we've been constructing a definition of what's called hostile work environment harassment, which is the most common and the grayest that has these elements of being unwelcome, of that the behavior is of a sexual nature or gender-based or, you know, or sexist, and, the, and it is frequent, severe, or pervasive enough that it interferes with somebody's job performance or creates a hostile, intimidating, or offensive work environment. Now that's all a lot of legal mumbo jumbo, right? Because at what point does something, who gets to decide whether it's creating an intimidating or offensive uh, work environment? Again as the recipients of the conduct, that's the first measure. And what a good manager and a good, a good policy will say is, even if it doesn't arise to the level of illegal harassment, we're not gonna wait for that determination. If people feel disrespected or feel violated or feel offended, we're gonna nip it in the bud. We're gonna interrupt it at that very low level of intensity so it doesn't get anywhere near there. And that's where you gotta have good people. You gotta have the best policy in the world and tell everybody about it and train people on it every week. And if you have an unskillful manager who you can't go tell because they're gonna ridicule you or dismiss you, what good is that policy, right? So there are lots of other moving pieces and they are not all necessarily gonna work perfectly. If you have one of those managers, you're gonna wanna think other, what are your other options, right? There are times when people get demoted because they don't have the people skills to be a manager. Or sometimes you have to go over the manager's head. But this is the basic definition of hostile work environment harassment. Everything we think that's hostile, I mean, let's say I swear at everybody all the time, I call them idiots. Mm -hmm. am, am I sexually harassing them? No. no. Might you think it's a hostile environment? Yeah. yeah, but just be aware, this is like when Toronto was saying use a different term. I would call that abusive behavior, I call it bullying. Hostile work environment is a specialized legal term that refers to discrimination, that refers to unwanted, frequent uh, behavior that's serious enough to undermine your work environment based on a protected identity. Race, sex, religion, disability, sexual orientation, gender identity, national origin, et cetera. And those are listed at the bottom. We didn't yet mention the other major category of sexual harassment, quid pro quo, which means this for that which is the classic sleep with me and you'll get the promotion. Yeah. 
right? Where that is uniquely engaged in by somebody with explicit hiring or firing power, a manager or supervisor, the employer is strict, automatically liable for that. Doesn't matter if it only happens once, and it you know, doesn't matter if they take corrective action. If a supervisor engages in harassment, for all intents and purposes, they are the employer. Right, because the, the organization doesn't exist except for the people that run the organization. Yeah, you something quick. Does it have quick? to be the person's supervisor or just any supervisor? Any supervisor, anybody who's in a position of power. Right. Okay. Um, so that's what quid pro quo is. The next thing, so I give you some examples, right? Sexual harassment in the next uh, section. Doesn't have to be physical, right? People through tone of voice, through gestures, through pictures, through emails. I mean, you can harass somebody in any number of ways. You can call it a love letter. And I'm so in love with you, I'm gonna wait for you in the parking lot at 2 a.m. You know, I mean, and right, the intent of that doesn't, doesn't matter. So just remember that just because it's outside the building or just because it's a screensaver that you happen to see, well, if that screensaver is in your workplace, that can have an impact on you. If it's a, you know, if it's a, a very offensive um, screensaver. So it's a very broad definition of conduct. And it's the conduct that matters. The sex, sexual orientation, and gender identity of the individuals is irrelevant. Anybody can engage in unwanted conduct towards anybody else. It doesn't have to be a man against a woman or a woman against a man or whatever. They don't have to both be straight. You know, it doesn't matter. It's the conduct and the impact that it has. Um, intent is not a factor. We talked about that. Economic harm is not required. No, the standard is that it interferes in that first second, interferes with job performance or creates that, that the creation of a toxic environment is injury enough, according to the law. Um, it can occur off-site or after hours. We covered that. It can be anybody. Third parties are protected. So there's the screensaver example, right? It's not directed at you. Somebody can't say, well, I wasn't talking to you, so you can't be harassed by that comment. Yeah. If it's in my work purview and I am harassed by it, I have a claim under the harassment policy. Um, and a, a longer description of the retaliation protection. Remember that you're protected even if you end up being wrong. If you have a good faith concern and you raise it, you should be protected against retaliation. So let's turn the page and talk about some of the things that you can do. If you are comfortable doing so, I always think it's, it's best when someone steps on your toe to say, ouch, you're stepping on my toe, please stop. I don't like it. And it's good, I think, to develop some uh, statements you can have in your back pocket for the people who you know you're going to be dealing with. Like, how many of you are going to go home on Thanksgiving and know there's that relative who's going to make the jokes about immigrants or the bad mouth comments about, right? So think now, plan now what kinds of things you're going to do and why. You know, are you just going to try to redirect the attention, say, no, let's not, let's, let's not talk about that. Are you gonna take that person aside privately and say, you know, it's always bothered me that you've done that. And I, you know, and now I finally wanna be able to tell you that it really is hurtful to me, right? Or you might decide to handle it a different way. I was starting to say the person who came up with this spectrum of activity, here are some of the corporate, bless you, suggestions they came up with. Um, I'm taking a moment to be sure I heard you right. <laughs> this, seems like a, this seems like a good time to take a break to reflect on what was just said. <laughs> if I look perplexed, it's because I'm thinking about how to give you the benefit of the doubt. <laughs> um, I suggest we step back for a moment as something just went awry. You saw that part of business review article. Of all the things I thought you might say, that certainly wasn't one of them. <laughs> I love these. Um, if I said what I'm thinking right now, we'd both be out of line. <laughs> Uh, for two people who respect each other, we're certainly off course today, aren't we? <laughs> um, do you want to run me by? You want to run that by me again, in a less personal way, or in a less, you know, racial or sexual, whatever it is? Did you really say that? Um, you know, I usually respond very defensively to comments like that, so just give me a moment <laughs> so that I can be sure that I respond to you respectfully. No, I really want to treat you respectfully, but I'm not feeling very respectful right now. Right? Um, if I didn't know you, I think you were insulting me. <laughs> I have a rule about comments like that one. I don't respond. Um, were you making a point or simply trying to amuse yourself at my expense? Um, right, so when people say, well, that, I'm only being funny, that often I'll say, well, actually, I don't think it's funny. So, it's like, so that wasn't a successful joke, I guess. Right, you want it to be funny, and I didn't find it funny. Yeah, three minutes, okay. 
Um, you're funny sometimes, but not today. All right, so let's, um, so things you can do, again, report it to somebody, get support. Sometimes you want to document it, you know, as it starts to get worse and worse, if you're doubting, is this the time I want to complain? You might want to keep a little bit of a record. He said it today, he said it the next day, you know, he said it in this place and that place. Um, what everyone can do, here are more phrases. I think we need to stand up more for each other and not just help people respond in the moment, but prevent it from happening to somebody else. My son, when he was in high school, we had a lot of conversations about this. Right, we have to raise kids proactively to create positive environments, not just say, don't you engage in sexual harassment, but we would say, you know, what are you going to do? He went to a very diverse school. You know, what can you do if you hear somebody else make a comment about your Dominican friend or your gay friend? And, you know, he kind of had his own repertoire in middle school of like, you know, what do you want to do that for? You know, let's go do something else. In high school, he probably had some other kind of, you know, response. But it helps to develop, you know, to practice them. Um, not avoiding excuses. You know, if we have coworkers who say, well, you know, I was just having a good time, or, you know, that person didn't mean anything by it, to stand up to them, even if they aren't the uh, perpetrator. Anybody here a manager or a supervisor? So here's the whole list of things that you can do besides just receiving complaints compassionately and open-mindedly. You can proactively make sure everybody knows about the, pro mm -hmm. the, about the policy, right? Initiate conversations about it. Ask people for feedback when you do performance reviews, when you're checking in with people. How's it going? How's the climate here? You know, are there things going on that maybe I don't know about, but I should know about, so I can interrupt them. Be proactive. Be a good role model. You know, these are obvious things, but they're things that, because this is such a charged topic, we don't always think about actually doing. Um, and then for those of you who are more interested in the uh, employer liability, um, that's at the bottom. Last questions before we have to wrap up. And I can stay for a few minutes afterwards if anybody wants to talk to me privately. Uh, just trying to think if there's any I think. I think I said pretty much everything I want to say. Yes? If you can speak to when it's not you who's being harassed, when you see someone going through harassment, yeah. the to support them. Without so in the situation itself? Yes. Okay, so in the situation itself, again, I cultivate some of these phrases, right? You know, can you say to a coworker, hey, let's not go there. Right, or let's get back to work. To better, uh, rather than deal with the person who's harassing, you like to support the person who was just harassed. Absolutely, so that importance of sometimes, you, you've seen that um, graphic about what, how to interrupt Islamophobia, like on the train, you know, go sit down next to the person and, and engage with them in conversation so that they're not in the line of fire anymore of the person who's doing it, right? Yes, there are lots of things you can do. Oh, I need you in my office now. Sorry, you know, sorry to interrupt the conversation. Anything you can do to express support, allyship, to stand with that person. And if, it's, if it goes by really fast, to go check and, you know, I saw what happened. You know, how are you feeling about that? Because it made me very uncomfortable. You know, is there something I can do to support you? Do you want to go talk to the manager together? Yeah. So I, I want to know if there is something to address the subjectivity of um, mm -hmm. appropriate and immediate yeah. in a sexist world. That Don't we do. wish. <laughs> Don't we wish? So, you know, some organizations try to specify it more quickly. In New York, in this new law, there is a 30 day time limit within which the employer has to make a decision. It makes it explicit that you don't have to complain in writing, and that's true. A, an oral complaint is enough, though often it's good to have a written, you know, written form to keep a record. Manager should always keep a, a record, so in case it's a repeat offender. Um, Again, it just it depends on the effectiveness, right, and commitment and goodwill of the leaders. I mean, people are so important. I think that's, in addition to training, probably who the people are and who the leaders are is one of the most um, uh, impactful factors. And that is, in fact, why often people leave their jobs, is because their boss or manager is not effective. And you can't make somebody do this well, right? They have to have intrinsic motivation to do it, unless sometimes if they get sued, the company might have a, then a, a desire to do it, and might get rid of that person, but we have to we have to contribute to generating that will, and be talking about it, and how it's impacting us, and how it's impacting the people that, that we care about, and talking to people who we know are good people, but who they themselves, like that first time, you're the, was it you who was saying you had a, or did that person leave? Yeah, yeah, you were saying that a coworker was subjected to something and the first time it wasn't that big a deal. Well, yeah. Right. Yeah. We were so so we need to remind our peers that just because somebody laughs at something doesn't mean they like it. Yeah. 
or just because somebody's putting up with your nonsense doesn't mean you're not still going to get into trouble down the line. So I would suggest you knock it off because people are going to reach a limit and you might be subjected to a harassment complaint. You know, educate people around you to dis, uh, dispel some of these misconceptions about, well, it didn't happen in the building. You know, or I didn't mean anything by it, so therefore it can't be harassment. You know, take this information out in the world. Lots more on the Mass Commission Against Discrimination website in Connecticut, in New York, and you have my email address, and you know, feel free to reach out to me at any time. Thank you so much for your time.